so as a military historian, I spend a fair amount of time thinking about not just the invasion at Normandy, but also the run up to it and what happens to make that decision. There's a kind of irrevocable moment where the Supreme Commander Dwight Eisenhower has to make the decision to go, but it's going to take a full day to sort of get everything together. Eisenhower does a number of things after making that decision, I think, to keep himself occupied. One of the things he does is writes this memo that will be issued in the event that the invasion is unsuccessful. And the thing that I think is the most fascinating about it is you can see his emendation. So he hasn't changed the thrust of what he's saying, but he changes the way he says it. He says the landings in the Cherbourg Hav area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold and the troops have been withdrawn, which is a very factual description of what he is concerned about happening. And Eisenhower scratches out the troops have been withdrawn and replaces it with I have withdrawn the troops. It's a very subtle change, but to me it makes all the difference, and, and other historians have noted this too, that he, he eliminates the passive voice and replaces it with the active voice, that this is something that Eisenhower is taking responsibility for. Which to me says something really interesting about the state of mind that he's in. And then he goes on um, and he crosses out a line in the, in the second paragraph and replaces it with my decision to attack at this point. And then the third paragraph, he's really rolling and he says, um, he places all the, the burden for the failure on his own shoulders. I think it's not just um, Ike's nobility that he shifts the blame to himself, although that's certainly a noble thing to do, but also the knowledge that should the cross-channel invasion fail, that's not going to be it. There's going to be another invasion. Um, they will spend a year probably building up, and that evasion will be even more difficult for many reasons, in part because you'll have to explain it to Americans on the home front about why this one's going to be different. And Eisenhower, in shifting all the blame to himself, has created an opportunity for his successor to come in and say, the last invasion was a failure, not because this is an impossible task, but because Eisenhower made mistakes. It's a terrific window into his thought process, and, and that it's in his own handwriting, and that you can see him thinking through some ideas, just really brings it home to me in a very immediate way. Virtually every soldier, sailor, airman, who's part of this massive invasion, gets a copy of what is, what is known as the Order of the Day. And it's a fascinating document as well, and you know, even though you can't see the emendations, what do you tell people about the cause and the, the reasons that they're being asked to do this? It's peppered with exclamation points, so there's a, a sort of resolution to it about, you know, the free men of the world are marching towards victory. It doesn't pretend that this is going to be easy. It doesn't talk about the Germans as, as pushovers or try to undermine the fighting strength of the Germans. And I think that's in part because nobody would have believed it. It's filled with confidence and determination. It has some religious overtones that this is, this is a crusade. It's not simply a, a military campaign, but that there's something bigger behind it. One of the things that historians pay really close attention to and think very carefully about when they're examining documents from the past is who is the audience? And how is this, this document going to be disseminated into the world? Because often that'll tell you a lot about how to read it. In the case of the, these two Eisenhower documents, it's especially fascinating because one is meant to be incredibly private and, and not to be released to the general public unless the invasion is unsuccessful. And the other is meant to be disseminated far and wide given to the soldiers and sailors and the airmen, printed in the newspapers. I mean, this is the official explanation of, of what we are doing in this campaign at this moment. And I think that helps you see why Eisenhower is taking really different tones in both. The, the short memo is, is Eisenhower putting himself at the center um, in this what-if world of what do we do if, if the invasion has to be withdrawn and then tried again later. In the order of the day, it's, it's multiple audiences. The first one is the, the audience that it's clearly addressing, soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force. I mean, that is who it's, it's written to, but the language that he uses, the great crusade, the eyes of the world are upon you, 
that those things are all very specific and very much a product of who he understands himself to be writing for. It's a really good lesson just that you always have to think about that as a scholar. You don't take the first document that you have and say, aha, this is the one window that tells me what this person was thinking. You try to get multiple things, and as you think about how they're the same and how they're different, you start to get some sort of clue of, of what is going on in the, in the mind of the, the individual or the organization that's put those out.